my friends, welcome back to the Books and Cables YouTube channel. I usually share videos about my knitting and my travels, but today we're going to begin something new, which is my journey into the sewing community, I guess. Um, I'm gonna warn you a little bit that this video could get long. I wrote out all the notes of all the things that I wanna talk about and it does go on a bit. I'm gonna try to limit myself, but as most of my friends know, I have a compulsive need to talk <laughs> and I can't stop doing it. So, you know, maybe do something else in the and leave me on in the background to blah, 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 blah at you. It is the year 2020, it's June, and we're about three months into a, a pandemic, also known as COVID-19, the coronavirus, whatever you want to call it. So I think this will be an interesting, maybe time capsule in a couple of years, interesting or dark. I don't know what you want to call it, but I have been following very strictly the public health guidelines that I should be staying home and keeping my distance from other people. As a result though, I have been alone for approximately almost four months now. And I have to say, I am sick of the sound of my own voice, but it's the only one I got. So now you're gonna have to hear it. <laughs> um, as a result of being at home full time, essentially, um, I am still working full time um, remotely. However, I'm finding that I just have extra hours in the day that I didn't have before. For example, you know, I used to have to get up at least an hour early to go to get to work, even though I'm walking distance away. Um, but I don't really necessarily have to get ready, put on clothes, shower, get my food for the day done. So I kind of wake up when I need to start working. And then um, during the day, because I'm not being interrupted, which is what used to happen at the office, you know, you have the natural interruptions from your coworkers dropping by to ask you a quick question or someone coming by to ask you if you want a coffee or you have a file you're working on and someone just wants to check with you on something. All of those little interruptions really add up and interrupt your productivity time. And I'm finding that because I'm working by myself now, um, I really get a lot of work done and in a row because every time you, so I don't know where I read this, but every time someone interrupts you, it takes you around 20 minutes to get back into the flow of things. So now that I don't have those interruptions or those interruptions are generally scheduled because we have to actively join in on a conference call, um, I am getting a lot more done in less time. And so before where I would just be sitting at my desk, scarfing down a lunch and continuing to work throughout the day, I'm finding that I actually am taking my breaks and, or I'm finishing my work much earlier than I used to. So I'm just carving out little pockets of time that I didn't exist before. And in addition, I don't really sleep until very late at night because I have trouble sleeping. So sometimes I have from five o'clock all the way until three in the morning to enjoy leisure time. And that means a lot of knitting time or so I thought. Um, I, for the first couple of weeks of being in the, it's not a lockdown because we were only, well, we were told not to go to work and we were told not to have gatherings more than I think two people at one point in my area, but it wasn't like official that you had to stay in your homes. We just, there was just nowhere to go. <laughs> Everything was closed. So, um, but the first couple of weeks of me being in my home, hiding from everyone, I was like, I'm gonna knit this whole time and get so much done. And in fact, I did finish two or three projects, but after knitting like eight plus hours a day, and everyone says I knit fast, I actually don't, I just knit a lot. So I knit like more than eight hours a day. and. I didn't realize it was possible, but I did get burned out on all of the knitting. And part of that is I knit as like part of my coping mechanism to deal with my anxiety. And while knitting was kind of calming and soothing, it doesn't actually distract me. I actually 
use it to relax, but it leaves my mind sort of free to just sort of continuing to chatter on, which is why I usually do it when I watch TV or do something else when I can be occupied. But, you know, after a while, I just found that I really needed something that would actually challenge my brain and occupy it. And that led me to kind of explore potential new hobbies that were still in the fiber related realm. At first, I like spent like two weeks deeply researching how to start weaving fabrics. And while I'm still super interested in doing that, I realized like the kind of weaving I wanted to do would involve like thousands of dollars of investment into a floor loom. That's not really in the cards right now. But when I thought more about it, the reason I was interested in weaving in the first place is because I'm fascinated by textiles and how these flat pieces can be rendered into 3D objects to clothe our body, <laughs> which is like a really pretentious sounding way of saying, I like clothes. Um, Increasingly in the last couple of years, rather than enjoying knitting as just like a function of itself, like enjoying the process, I found that I've become more and more interested in um, knitting as just one of many methods of constructing garments. And it, even more than that, how our clothing reflects us as people, individual people, as cultures and our histories and class and all of those things. And I think the natural extension to that is then learning how to sew because I want, I have become a lot more conscious of like where our clothing come from and, you know, the ethics of how they're made and sustainability and all of those things. So sewing has been on my mind, maybe not at the front of it, but it came fairly naturally when I was looking for a new hobby to do. Um, well, and luckily one of my good friends, Megan, who usually comes to my local knitting group, but obviously we haven't been meeting, but sh I met her when she actually started knitting in this last year, but she's a very avid sewist. And so she really gave me the inspiration and push and a lot of wonderful advice to help me get started, including providing me a list of like basic essential sewing supplies so I could start making garments, which is what I was primarily focused on making. Um, but I actually had one major problem. It turns out, it turns out that if you are both depressed and living alone, it is not particularly conducive to having a clean apartment. And it also turns out that in order to sew, you actually need to have some amount of room in order to lay out your fabric and cut it. So I made a bargain with myself in order for me to allow myself to plunge into the world of sewing, I actually needed to retake up one of my previous projects, which is to create a sewing room in my second bedroom. Like it is a pretty nice space here that I never used for anything except for storage, which is ridiculous. But the reason was I had a lot of stuff that wasn't well organized and I just put it everywhere. And because I lived by myself, no one was there to nag me about it. But now I'm here to nag me about it. I did originally, I did start on this project to make this room a nice place maybe two years ago. That's when I bought this chair and an ottoman. I thought having a nice um, chair would create like a cozy environment to knit in. But then I sort of remembered that anywhere you can sit down, you can knit. So it wasn't really necessary to have a, an entire room. That's why the project stalled. But now that I needed a sewing space, I use that as a very good, not excuse, but very good reason that I should clean this all up. Now, here's a clip of the aftermath. I'm not gonna show you the before because it was absolutely terrible. But let me just tell you, it no longer looks like that, but that image of that calming space in my mind is beautiful. So I'm gonna 
let you keep that image in your head and I will not show you what it looks like, although I think you'll see it in the background of some videos. There is sort of crap everywhere on the ground, but at least I can see the ground, which is much different than it was before. So, like I said, there's still a pandemic going on, so I couldn't exactly waltz into a store and buy all the supplies I needed. So I ended up making a couple of orders to different stores, such as Fabrications, which is the local um, fabric store here in Ottawa, to Wawak, I believe. It's like a major sewing supply company. Um, also to a bunch of other just like regular stores, so I could get an iron, a board, and various things like that. And then I spent the next two to three weeks compulsively checking mail, um, <laughs> mail trackings. But obviously a watched mail tracker never foils. <laughs> but I still became like sort of hyper focused, which is what I do when I have a new hobby, which is I get super, super interested and that's all I want to do for the first um, like, weeks or months. And so I had all of this energy that I didn't know where to put. So I ended up watching pretty much all of sewing YouTube. <laughs> um, I think I finished it. Um, I watched so many sewing vlogs and then I went back and rewatched some of my favorites because I guess the more you knowledge you sort of gain, the more some of the older stuff makes sense. So I just sort of kept watching them. And so I got a real sense of um, the rhythm of sewing, but also I think I gained a lot of confidence from watching those videos. So to take a, maybe just to open a parenthesis, I would describe my style inspiration as a Scottish fisherman <laughs> or like British countryside or a British countryside next to the sea. Like I wear a lot of cabled sweaters, a lot of color work, like inspired by Shetland Fair Isle style knitting. Um, and I have been in love with like Harris Tweed for a really long time. It's a very expensive fabric to be able to sew with, but I do have two pairs of Harris Tweed pants that I bought on my trip to Scotland. So that's sort of my, like, I really love that like rustic, wooly type look. And I think a logical extension of that is uh, a lot of Victorian late like late Victorian Edwardian type tailoring because that's when a lot of wool was employed. So it sort of sent me down this vintage historical costuming rabbit hole and um, going back to where this parenthesis started, the reason why that was very helpful to me is because I was watching all of these like very regular people just in their apartments, in their small houses, making, making elaborate, fantastically elaborate costumes. And, you know, because they were learning to do things in a historic manner, like there are no like proof of how to do it. So everything is new and they were just jumping right into it. So for me, it was like quite inspirational because I was like, okay, so learning to sew for the first time, I shouldn't be really scared to take on any projects. If they're willing to use a painting in order to recreate an outfit that nobody can is sure how it was made in the first place. So I found that quite inspiring. That led me to go against most of the advice that I've had been given and my initial and go with my initial instinct, which was to make something that I actually wanted to make and rather than hyper focus on the kind of arbitrary labeling of things as for beginner, advanced, you know, all of, uh, because that has no real kind of bearing on whether or not you would do well, like, of course, it would be easier for me to have learned on a project bag, but I don't want to do that. And I think there was a big chance I would have started the project and never finished it because I wasn't interested. So it's kind of the same advice I give to people who start knitting is 
yeah, you could just learn how to make scarves and stay in scarf land forever. Or you can do something you actually want to do and you have a lot of things, maybe they're not perfect, but you have something that you were actually, you know, like having. And so, you know, which is not to say that it's like negative or bad if you did start with a pillowcase or a project bag or an A-line skirt. It's just that I knew that even if I did those things, those things would go to waste because I wouldn't use them. Like I don't really wear A-line skirts. So if I made it, what I would essentially be doing the same as fast fashion. I would be buying something for the purpose of it going into the dump eventually. So that is the reason why I chose to go with a fairly uh, arduous, <laughs> complicated, not com it's not complicated, just it has a lot of pieces to it. And actually it took quite a bit to fit it because you, you know, pants are something that I have difficulty with in most circumstances. And so I think some of the struggles I have getting ready to wear clothes to fit my body also happens on sewing patterns. And I don't, th so what I'm about to say may not necessarily be a fair reflection on the sewing pattern or the designer. It's just that my body is hard to fit. And I think that's something like we need to maybe take as a grain of salt because I read a lot of reviews of patterns and people always talk about fit and how well it fit. Well, that means your body was the closest to the measurements that they used. It doesn't actually mean a pattern is good or bad. A pattern can be bad if the instructions are unclear, but I don't know if you can talk about fit as a way of measuring the quality of a pattern because it was designed perfectly for a set of measurements that are standardized, but they're not designed to fit your body. So you do have, I learned that you do have to spend a lot of time fitting things. And that's kind of the wonderful benefit of making your own clothes. All right. So, um, I, like I said, I made a lot of orders and it took a while for them all to wing their way to me. And, um, I think I'm going to tell you about, it on another occasion what my starter kit of sewing supplies were because I think I need a little bit more time working with it all to figure out like if I actually like it or was it good enough because I've never used anything differently or are there things that I thought would be helpful and not so I want to be able to like narrow down that list to like the best possible like essentials list before I tell you about it. And also like, I don't know anything about sewing right now. So even if I did tell you, maybe the advice wouldn't be what I would say, you know, a year from now. So I'm going to leave that for now, but I did, um, finally receive, I received my sewing machine, I think earliest out of everything. And uh, that was a problem because I had no thread in the house at all. So it was just sitting there and I was like, well, it sure does turn on, <laughs> but I couldn't really test it any other way. But finally I received my order from fabrications. I'm going to put a photo of it here. It's not all I ordered, but I'm showing you this picture because it's the most aesthetic one that I took. Um, and that included the paper the, or not paper, the printed pattern for the Burnside bibs some thread finally and a variety of, like scissors, some other things. And so with those supplies in hand, I had to go about figuring out how the machine works. Now I gotta tell you, I've been terrified of sewing machines my entire life. Part of that fear has been sort of deepened lately because my parents have uh, maybe in the last five, 10 years start, I don't really remember actually, maybe in the last 10 years, have started a custom embroidery business, which means my dad is working, my parents, actually both of them, work full time with like industrial strength embroidery machines and they machine embroider. And my dad had to go to the emergency room because he punctured his finger with one of the machines and had to get a lot of stitches. Anyway, so needles freak me out. But I think once I actually got a machine for myself and examined how it works, it's actually pretty impossible to get your fingers under there and um, do that. And in fact, I found that out when I tried to operate the machine without the footer down. So it kind of beeped at me. You'll see it in the clip 
that I'm probably overlaying over me chatting right now, it uh, sort of goes, hey, and then I was like, what's going on? And I try to change all of the features, but luckily for you, I'm just inserting a quick clip. I'm not subjecting you to the entire ride on the struggle bus that I took <laughs> because there was a lot of just like, what? <laughs> Looking at the instructions, pulling out YouTube, watching the video, rewinding, rewinding, watching it again. So until I figured it out, but you'll see how pleased with myself I am when I actually managed to sew my first line of stitches for the first time in my life. And uh, fantastic as Instagram is, they all told me that the tension was too tight, so I did it wrong. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, I hope that didn't sound salty. <laughs> It was just like, I was like, look at my first stitches. And then I got a bunch of responses were like, you got to change the tension. And I was like, <laughs> um, thank you. Very helpful people. You, um, Instagram has really been a fantastic source of me learning about the sewing world. So I'm really happy about that. All of that said, we're finally arriving at my first sewing project. Well, my first sewing project that I started, not the first one I ended up finishing, but here it is, my Burnside bibs. I'm gonna do a full, a better video at the end when I kind of reveal to you my finished object, although you can kind of see it. But um, I, like I said before, I got the, um, my, the paper printed pattern from the paper printed pattern, the printed pattern from Fabrications and I learned very quickly that I hate tissue paper. So I know people take the time to trace their patterns onto sturdier paper, such as Swedish tracing paper, but I, and I intended to do that, but I didn't buy the right paper and I didn't want to wait another week before I started. So I decided to cut it all up. So I, yeah, like I said, I really hate it. Like the tracing paper, there's so many pieces to this pattern and I had the fan on and it blew everywhere and I couldn't figure out top to bottom. So cutting it was <laughs> the only way I could not throw it out. <laughs> um, I was like, oh, we're good, we're good. okay. So because I didn't really anticipate any major fit issues with this pattern, I had compared the sizing chart and finished actual measurements to my measurements. And it seemed like it would have a lot of ease. So because I didn't anticipate those issues, I cut out every single piece of the pattern, which was a lot like 16 or something onto um, uh, just mock-up fabric muslin. And um, I intended to basically do the pattern from top to bottom just for the experience of making the pattern, not really anticipating I would need to do a lot in terms of fit. That was my fatal error, as I will see. Um, because when I, f after spending all of this time properly finishing, you know, Ziploc, Ziploc, zig zag stitching all of the edges and all of that and getting the pockets fit on, it took me like out like three hours just to do the front because there was so much, I don't think it was three hours. I mean, it might be exaggerating, but it took a long time to finish even the front piece, let alone joining in the back piece. So it was sort of, a lot of work had gone into this mock-up by the time I finally got around to trying it on. And it was immediately obvious that the crotch was too tight. And not only that, it was sort of really tight around the hips as well. I couldn't really, I didn't really have a full range of motion and I couldn't put my hands inside the pockets, which is obviously a very important factor because where are you gonna put your stuff? Um, so anyway, this led me to first starting to patch and make adjustments by adding little pieces of fabric to extend the crotch. But I sort of at that point regretted cutting out all of the pieces and sewing them on because it sort of got in the way as I was trying to make the adjustments because like, you know, the pockets really limited the range of motion and I needed to adjust the whole pants and adjust the position of the pocket accordingly to make fix that. So in the end, I just decided to go ahead and cut out a second pair of pants so that I could actually see the issues more clearly just on the pants fabric alone. So um, 
And I think I'll be playing a sequence of all of the different mock-ups I went through. I mean, they're not all unique mock-ups, but variations on each other. I don't know if you can actually tell the difference between them. I think I could tell the difference, but I just felt like I was making progress, but not really resolving the problem. And at one point, um, I kind of lost track and I ended up sewing the wrong sides to the right sides, etc. So I was in a bit of a fever dream, basically. So I decided I needed to take a break because honestly, at that point, I didn't really know what pants were as a concept. I didn't really know like how they were supposed to fit. And then I had looked through a lot of photos of this, these bibs on Instagram and realized that a lot of people seemed to be having kind of various, various degrees of the same fitting issues, but they were still like really happy with their pants. So like I sort of was starting to suspect maybe I was like kind of crazy or something. And you know, like, I was like, what are pants? And then I started to see regular photos of people wearing pants and they don't seem to fit either. So I, I'm, I sort of was like, what is the meaning of life? And what are we all doing here? And what is fabric? What is sewing? So I was starting to go a little bit around the twist. So I decided maybe it's time to do something different, at least to take a pause. So now my mother had learned to sew while I was very young. She wanted to make me some clothes that were, you know, like little cute dresses. So I, she did give up at one point, but she saved all the fabric that she bought at the time. So these are all like 20 year old fabric that I got her to mail to me. As you can see, there's like a strong teddy bear theme throughout the thing. But then as I look through this pile, I see clowns, clown fabric for me, a child. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. Maybe clown were clowns ever not scary. Let me know about that. But um, anyway, I had all of this extra fabric finally before I literally only had muslin fabric. So now I had fabric to work with. So I decided I was gonna try to make something else, which were also in the pants realm, but shorts this time. So they would be a little bit faster. So I kind of just started looking up pleated shorts cause that's sort of a style I wanted to have because I saw someone wearing like a beautiful like short suit Pant, you know, like how a pantsuit, <laughs> though a short suit. So it was like a blazer with pants, but they were all made out of linen. So it was like a summer business outfit. And I really liked that look. So I found this pleated shorts pattern. It's like the first free pattern that comes up when you Google it. I don't really remember what it was called, like jewels or something. So I printed it out and I pasted it all together. And I kind of realized that the crotch shape and the general shape of the shorts were different to how my burn side bibs looked. So I thought, so I, I didn't want to go through the whole thing of fitting again. I just wanted to like make the full thing through just to prove that I was capable of it. Um, so here I am cutting out some teddy bear fabric to make these shorts. So I went ahead and just sewed up the whole thing and then worried about the fit after. So here's a photo of me trying it on. As you can see, the, it's, the fit is pretty decent. I would say the only thing was maybe the crotch did need a little bit more room. So that sort of showed me that it was gonna be a common adjustment that I needed to make. So I was on the right track with my fitting adjustments, but you know, at that point, I was very reluctant to go back to the Burnside bibs, but my friend Megan said, do one more mock-up, just one last one. And then I was allowed to give up if at that point it wasn't going to work. So um, I decided to cut the last mock-up out of the clown fabric because I considered these bottoms as evil as clowns at that point. So I thought it was fitting. Like I said, I compared the pattern piece for these shorts to my Burnside bibs pattern. And I realized that the hips were a lot wider and the fit was a lot better on the shorts. I think largely as a result, because it wasn't sort of pulling in 
on the outside of my hips, whereas I was only adjusting on the inside of my um, thighs. So I, on this draft, I kind of, well, I sort of failed to true up the crotch lines very well, so I fixed that. But then the other major change I made was to swing out the hips. So I didn't, I made sure not to um, change the length of anything, but I added some more room in the hips area to, um, to have more space for this butt. So um, as you will see, a lot of the problems I think were resolved because of those hips. And you know what? To be honest with you, that seemed to have been my initial instinct. And I guess I have to start listening to my initial instinct more because I, I knew from the beginning that I thought it was tight on the hips. And that ended up being the adjustment that made the biggest difference. And more importantly, which is my test of all pants, is can I squat down in them? I don't know when I would need to squat, but I'd like to know that I can do it. And so I could squat down finally. And, and I really love the drape of it and the shape that it was now making. I thought it was actually looking a lot more like what the intended fit was on the photos, um, which I think ended up that way for those people because they were a lot straighter of a line and I have a lot more shape. And so in order to achieve that same effect, I actually do did need the extra sort of hip space to be able to get that like more straight um, silhouette. So I felt comfortable enough at that point to be able to order my real fabric. And it came a few days later, you'll see me unpacking it all uh, and sort of dropping things along the way. So now that my adjusted pieces were ready and I actually took two days off of work, just it happened at the same time. And so I thought, you know, I'm gonna use my two days in order to make this project. So this is a the Robert Kaufman um, linen rayon blend. It's Brussels dot washer or Brussels washed yarn, something like that. Um, it's like, really tweedy looking, which I love in a fabric. I don't really like sort of solid colors. I really like this sort of mixed blended color. So it's done by using different color threads and weaving them together, which is actually the method that is used to make Harris tweed, my favorite fabric that I cannot afford. So I thought it would emulate the look that I wanted while still being seasonally appropriate and not wool. So. I first did pre-wash this fabric, which I was like terrified of because I don't really like using my washing machine if I can avoid it. But my friend Megan, again, very wise person, said the purpose of the pre-washing is to make sure like if the worst case scenario happens, somebody throws it into the wash, like it doesn't at that point completely shrink and lose its shape and whatever. And so I did it. I did put it in the dryer and so much lint came out of it. I did not know where it came from. I was surprised there was any fabric left, but there was the fabric looked generally unchanged, if only a little bit softer. Um, I thought it was gonna set on fire. Like it was more lint than I've ever seen in my life. Like, like uh, handfuls of, anyway. So I'm not sure if I love this, fabric where I hate it. It's kind of finicky and it's both like the best fabric I could have bought for a beginner because it sort of is so, so dark and sort of it creates this optical illusion. So you can't really see a lot of mistakes. And in fact, the color matched um, thread that I bought from Fabrications was so well matched, I couldn't really see it whenever I made mistakes to be able to rip it out. <laughs> but at the same time the it's like sort of very loosely woven like it's very thick like it definitely has body but the strands themselves are not like very tight in there so it immediately started just like fraying and shedding 
and um and there was like a lot of little it was just like not very tight so i needed to change my stitch tension to like a very loose one so that it didn't sort of all get bumpy at the same time because the instructions say i had i should overlock or zigzag stitch if i didn't have a serger the edges um because it was so like weak on the edges and fraying sometimes my machine like ate it <laughs> like if i wasn't careful in the corners as i started to zigzag stitch the machine would just sort of go and swallow it and then i would have to like spend a bunch of time undoing it and like i said you couldn't see the thread so it was impossible to tell like when what i was weaving out but like i said it was very good at hiding mistakes because it's sort of very dark and all of that so in that way it's sort of really nice for a beginner who makes a lot of mistakes um unfortunately i actually did run out of the thread i bought i forgot that the first spool i bought was like 500 yards and this like color match one was only like 150 so i really should have bought two or three maybe two well three to would have been safer and i would have had extra which is like just nice when you're practicing i guess but anyway that was my mistake but i did have the black yarn i used just to do practice on and because it looked i i to be honest i I sewed it next to each other, it looked the same. So instead of stopping and ordering another thread and waiting a week for it, which also didn't seem very like environmentally friendly just to get someone to deliver <laughs> a package of just thread. So I decided I was just gonna continue with black and you know, it'll have to do. And to be honest, like I did it, you can, I can't even tell the difference. Like, and if you're that close, and looking and saying, oh, your thread isn't matching, then you're probably too close to me. <laughs> so I was just like, oh, you know, we're in coronavirus times. It's going to be a interesting memory of the time. And I could say, ah, that's where I ran out of the thread, but I couldn't go out and get more. <laughs> so it's part of the story of this garment. So it's fine. It all generally went fairly smoothly because at this point I had made parts of the pattern so many times and um, having already finished a few, uh, like one other project, I felt a little bit more confident in my ability to sew straight. I mean, it still kind of looked like I tripped every couple of inches or whatever, because I, you know, but you know, it didn't look like I was drunk anymore <laughs> while I was sewing. So I think overall I would say it went pretty well and like I'm kind of proud of like how these pockets looked. So and the top stitching that's in these things like it's not perfect but I think it's fairly it's fairly decent job that I did on it. I did make one major mistake on the straps and that was my fault because I didn't read the instruction properly. As it turns out, if you read the instructions, it like tells you how to do it properly in there. <laughs> so I read the instructions that said fold the straps to the center and then press it. I failed to read and see the diagram <laughs> which showed you have to then fold it again and press it together and then you would top stitch around it. So I read, fold it to the middle and top stitch around it. So I did that and I basically wore this to my friend Megan's house and then was like, I don't understand why these straps are like, how could it, this possibly be the way it's done? Because they're just fraying everywhere. There's just like threads and I was just shedding like crazy. And she was like, I think you were supposed to do fold it over again. And I was like, pardon <laughs> and, and she said yeah you're supposed to fold it over again and she showed me in the instructions by the way um the some of the lockdown restrictions have lifted now which is so you're allowed to have like extra people in your bubble so because we've both been sort of isolating at home she was my extra person in the bubble and i also had some extenuating circumstances for visiting her basically they shut down the water on my street and there was a lot of there was basically police activities 
on my street for about 28 hours, so I had to go somewhere else because there was no drinking water here and a lot of guns around. So I went to stay with her for a bit. Um, and she pointed out that I did it wrong. So I did have to re go back and um, cut out. So it was quite difficult the second time because basically there's two layers of the bib fabric. There's the facing and then there's the back of it. And so you sew the straps onto the back and then you would sew the facing right side to right side and then you flipped it around. So essentially I had to pull it out from the middle and then reinsert it back to the same spot and then sew it back up. So it kind of got a little bit messy around these edges when I sewed it back again, but I think it actually got better once I like washed it and it sort of this the fabric kind of evened out again. All in all, I this is um, what it looks like finished. Here is me walking, sort of catwalking. Do -do -do. <laughs> I don't know how to add sound effects in editing, so I'm gonna do my own. <laughs> um, so my final thoughts on the Burnside bibs. I really love this pattern. I've seen a lot of variations of it on Instagram and I like how versatile it is. You can really style it up or down depending on the fabric that you use uh, and also, you know, the way you style it, what you wear it with, you know, um, like in a Tweety sort of more structured fabric like this one, which still has a bit of drape, you could always wear like a black turtleneck underneath and you could definitely make it a work look. Uh, maybe not in a formal workplace, but in like a business casual type setting, which is where I generally work. I could definitely get away with this at work. Um, the one thing I will say is the straps are really annoying. So if you want to pee, it is kind of a struggle because it's not, you know, a lot of clothes now have fake closures that make it easier to take them on and off. And this one is like a real working strap. And I actually don't think I'm tying them properly. I sort of do it differently every time. So I realized I didn't crisscross them this time when I tied it. It still seems generally to fit properly, but yeah, it gives you in the book a bunch of different methods of, for tying it. So it's sort of a choose your own adventure in that way. But you know, if you're a frequent peer, it might not be the outfit for you. Um, the other thing is, so I did spend a lot of time fitting it. I can't remember if I said it on this take because I've refilmed this many times, but I don't think it's fair to judge the designer based on how well something fits you because your everybody's bodies are different. And for me, I'm very disproportional. So these ended up requiring a lot of adjustments but this is the problem I have with most pants is like it assumes someone of my size should be quite tall and so when I cut out the pattern it said where the knees are on the pants were where my ankles were <laughs> so clearly too long for me unless I wanted to have a train <laughs> as I walked. It did take a while but pants you know if you want them to fit properly it's good to take your time on that and I'm very happy with the fit I ended up with as a result of all of the effort I put in into making sure that it did. Another thing is there were a lot of pieces to this pattern. Like I felt like I was like sewing for hours and hours and then not really seeing a lot of progress because you would be doing like a lot of decorative stuff like doing the pockets and doing the po top stitching and stuff. So it felt like sometimes the progress didn't feel like it was happening as fast as it felt like it should have. but. That's not really something I can fault the pattern for. It was just that I'm impatient to finish things. But, you know, that's something to consider, I guess, if you kind of want like the instant satisfaction of finishing something and like maybe taking on like so many different pieces is something that would discourage you, then that's definitely something to consider. Um, but I think it was like a good pattern to have chosen it does say confident beginner, and I don't know what better way to describe myself other than confident beginner, because I am, um, I tend to overthink the more I know stuff. <laughs> so the fact that I don't know anything about sewing actually gave me a lot of freedom to do whatever I want and do it however I think I should do it. 
oftentimes it kind of goes against the advice of other people are giving me and I'm like thank you for the advice I'm just gonna do it my way but yeah so I feel like I'm gonna lose that over time the more I learn so I'm kind of like basking in it right now because usually I'm such a like anxious overthinker and like perfectionist like I'm like a per perfectionist to the point where I procrastinate things because I'm like already angry at myself for not being able to execute it as well as I want to see it in my head. <laughs> so like there's a sort of freedom in being like, well, I've never done it before. So it's better than not doing it. <laughs> like compared to zero, I'm doing pretty well. And I guess my next project, I'm going to be a little bit more harsher on myself, but this one I'm really happy with. And I think I did a really good job. So I'm going to give myself a pat for that. Now, what are my key takeaways from my first sewing projects? So number one, sewing is hard. <laughs> There's so many different things you have to redo. And little, yeah, sewing is hard. I don't know how to summarize it, but that. There's just a lot of moving pieces that go all into making a project, you know, like you can't just add extra fabric in one spot because then it's going to change something in another spot because you're trying to make a flat thing fit onto a 3D thing. And sewing is very hard. I think everyone was trying to tell me this, but like I said, overconfident beginner. Um, number two, sewing is very physical. Like I thought I was doing freaking yoga most of the time as I was cutting out the pattern and I had to move from over here pressing and making sure to, you know, tense up my body to hold the fabric while I was pressing to make sure it got the right shape. I was moving over there to sew, you know, there was a lot of like, I don't know, seam changes, that's not the right word, just like context changing. So it's not like when knitting, you just do the same activity, right? You just knit and then you change context in that you start seaming, but that those are finishing things. Like for sewing, you're doing many different activities at the same time in order to reach the next step. And I moved a lot more than I did for the last couple of months because I was in quarantine. So I really feel like I can justify it by saying my workout is sewing. <laughs> and what a wonderful way of getting your daily <laughs> exercising in by making something beautiful. Okay, so number three uh, thing that I learned was um, I really should take the time and do some hand basting or like more delicate work I should be prepared to take out the needle. I don't know why it didn't really occur to me. I guess I just didn't have enough thread. I could just like quickly pull out some and, you know, start hand sewing. But hand basting makes a big difference. There was um, to get the facing down on the waistband or the back facing on, I had to um, match up something on the inside before I sewed it in order to top stitch it. And if I just at the beginning hand basted it down where the stitches would have gone, I would not have ended up sewing that four times. <laughs> so in the end I had to hand baste it. But first I failed at sewing it four times. And you know that would have saved me a lot of time if I just slowed down, took the time to do that step. Um, number four, Read the instructions. <laughs> the instructions are not trying to mislead you. And if you don't know anything about sewing, you should probably listen to the person who is explaining to you how to do the thing instead of being like, yeah, I'm going to assume what the next step is. So that's how I got the straps wrong. And in fact, it does say do the belt loops on the back the same way. And in fact, I did those wrong, but because they're so well secured down, because I did read the instructions to like go over the belt loops a lot of times, um, I'm not going to go back and fix it. But I did wonder why they were so thick. So I was supposed to fold them over again before I sewed it onto the belt, but it's too late for that now. Um, read the instructions. It's important. Heidi. Um, Number five, no more physical patterns. I do not want any more physical patterns. I have printed out a few things on a regular paper and taped them together. It is time consuming, but I kind of found it meditative and I like 
the more sturdier paper you got as a result. And, um, and in addition, a lot of printed patterns have limitations in terms of sizing. This time round, I took a gamble and I bought a printed pattern which had my size as the largest, but it's actually quite rare that a pattern actually went up to size 20. Um, and I, maybe it would not have resolved all of the fit issues I had, but it would have been nice when I was struggling with the fit to have the option of going up a size. Like I, I really don't think it would have solved the issue because the pattern is like drafted to be very straight. And I, regardless of like how wide the legs were, I, I think I did need that extra curve to get it around my butt properly. So, but you know, it would have been nice to have the option of going up a size. And I, like I said, I hate tissue paper. So both of those things add up to, I think I prefer to do PDFs from now on. Oh, and also I have a short attention span and I like to make things based on impulse. So um, being able to download a pattern and print it out right away is very nice. <laughs> Number six, be careful of the grain. So I, was a bit fast and loose with it. Well, this is sort of related to number seven, actually. Make sure to cut your longest pieces first. So I ran out of fabric <laughs> by the time I did the straps and that one needed quite a long length of fabric. So I really should have cut it out first because it doesn't need a lot of width. So it would have been easy to cut that part and then not, and then been able to do all of the other pieces fine. But um, yeah, I didn't plan that very well. So I ended up having to piece together the, the straps out of like four lengths of um, fabric. And then because I was using the leftovers, they were slightly off grain. I don't think it's gonna affect necessarily, like it doesn't look obvious that it's slightly off grain, but it might be that it stretches out over time. Like it's not as off grain as being on the bias that it would be like truly stretchy, but I think it just wouldn't be as like durable as if I cut it properly. <laughs> So make sure you actually have enough fabric for the most finicky pieces of your pattern. Number whatever we are, eight, is maybe my weird body. And I say that like not as a negative way. Like uh, I, I mean, my body I know is proportioned in a very unique way to myself. I don't find that to be like a thing to say. I really love my body as it is. So knowing the specificities of my own body and my own person, I think it might be more practical going forward to have several basic like slopers and blocks, pattern blocks that I can adjust to make the shapes that I want rather than buying patterns and then wasting a lot of fabric doing mock-ups and adjustments. Yeah, it might be a little bit more practical knowing that I have a difficult time fitting clothes to my body that are at least, you know, base, that are designed based on those like standard sizing charts. Now that I finished my first projects, what are my next steps into sewing? So like I mentioned, I got really deep into like the vintage historical costuming areas of the world. So I would, so I would really love to explore more in that direction. I'm thinking more like vintage style, like 1940s styles for everyday wear. I might look to see what I can like transition in, in terms of sort of more 40s style vintage wear on a daily basis. Not that I'm seeing anyone at the moment because I'm in here full time, but that might be interesting to look into. I really would like some more sort of suit, suit related, like wool suit type things that I could pair with my knitted garments. Like my, um, did I ever show you? One of my my vests that I made, the Fall River vest, I think that would look really fantastic if I would able, were able to make some um, 
woolly pants to go with it. I do, like I said, already own woolly pants, but now that I spent all of this time on this pants journey, I realized that they don't fit properly. So I would love to make some well-fitted woolly pants to go with um, my garments like that. I have a variety of other color work and keyboard garments that would look fantastic with some more of these like vintagey feel wool type clothing um, and suits and stuff. So yeah, that's number one. And then number two, I have always been obsessed with making costumes and I love the idea of like being able to sew like not normal things. I'm just like already like, oh, I don't want to make basics. I want to make a costume. So um, I would love to explore more in terms of the historical costuming side of things. Also in terms of just like generally cosplaying things from TV shows, books, movies, etc. that I love. So that's something I would love to explore more. Um, I think that's it for now. If you've just started sewing recently, tell me what you're working on and um, tell me what your next project is going to be. If you've been sewing for a while, um, let me know, you know, uh, what your favorite things to make are and what inspired you to start sewing in the first place. Did you learn from someone, a loved one? Did you teach yourself? I would love to know all of that for anyone new, old, any, any, any sort of way. So thank you for joining me on this very long video. If you actually made it to the end, let me know because I'm amazed and thank you. And um, I'm going to try to post a little bit more often. No promises because I am the worst at sitting down and filming videos, but I do have some more knitting project vlogs that I'm in the midst of filming, so they're definitely coming. And I have some other small plans for videos. All right, my camera cut me off on the last bit, but at least I don't have to refilm about 20 minutes. Um, I was just saying, you know, ah, the usual words. <laughs> if you haven't already, subscribe, click that subscribe button. If you don't know about it, there's apparently a bell button that will notify you when I make new videos, so you can hit that if you'd like. Um, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, my username is Books and Cables. Um, that's pretty much where I spent most of my times on the internet. So if you wanted to send me a DM over there, that would be awesome. I'd love to meet you. Um, and I hope to see you again. Bye-bye.